So, Alright, I got three packages in today, and some of these parts are going to be for that yellow 83 944, and some of them are going to be for this silver 944. So let's get it open and see what we have here. Alright, let's see what we got. Alright, first we have a head gasket set for the 83 engine that's on the stand over there. Pelican part sticker. Next I have a front main seal for that 83 engine and I also picked up some extra seals for the oil pump drive sleeve. And I'm always needing them so it's nice to have spares. And I have some pilot bearings here. One is for this car here since I'm changing the clutch and the other one is for the 83 engine. Even though I'm not changing the clutch on it, I might as well change it while I have the engine out. Next we have this package from FedEx. throw out bearing guide too. I always try and replace these when I can. I actually have a stack of these so uh, the next time I get parts plated I may just go ahead and have them re because most of them are still like new. And we have the packing slip. Next I have two rear main seals. One of course for this car and the other for the 83 on the stand. So just like I'm changing the pilot bearing, I thought I'd go ahead and change the rear main seal while I was at it. And I'm gonna go ahead and change the clutch port bearings on this car. So I bought two of those. And then we have an oil cooler gasket set for the 83 engine. So all right, now that I have these parts in, I'm going to remove the flywheel so I can have it resurfaced and replace the rear main seal. So all right, I'm getting ready to take the flywheel off and you can see here how I have a rod that's going to hold the flywheel in place while I loosen the bolts. And once I have the flywheel off, I'm gonna be resurfacing it and replacing the rear main seal and the pilot bearing there. I'm going to have this rear main seal out now, so I'm going to go ahead and remove this pilot bearing. So I now have the flywheel, the rear main seal, and the pilot bearing out. And you can see my new rear main seal, pilot bearing there. Here's the clutch fork, and I've got new needle bearings for it. Tomorrow I'm going to take the flywheel and have it resurfaced. And I also have a new guide tube sleeve here to replace this one over here. So now that I have the new pilot bearing in, I'm going to be cleaning everything up and then installing the new rear main seal. So I now have the pilot bearing and new rear main seal in. So alright guys, I got the clutch in for this car today and I'm going to be unboxing that for you. You may have noticed that I had the intake off here and that's because I had a little bit of trouble with the uh, speed and reference sensors. They did not want to come out. What I wanted to do was pull them out and then have this bracket already gapped when I put the bell housing back on and just stick the reference sensors back in there. But no such luck, they were very difficult to remove. So what I did was just went ahead and pulled the entire bracket out. And since I have to gap it all over again, I thought it was just easier to remove the intake. And uh, then I squirted some WD-40 down in here, let it sit overnight sitting up like this. And uh, now they came out just fine. And uh, when I go to gap everything, I'll have plenty of room and it won't be a big deal. Now, I also have the belts off again and there's a good explanation for that. The past few times that I've had to do the timing on this car, I've had to guess exactly where the TDC mark is. As you may know, the early cars only have one mark and it's the OT mark. And if it gets rusted over or corroded over, you can't sometimes see it. So that was the case with this car. I often had to guess where TDC was 
just going by a dowel in the cylinder there and I didn't like that so when I had the chance while I had the flywheel off I went ahead and painted some marks on there and I'll never have to guess again so I'll be showing you that here in a minute and uh, I figured since now I know exactly where TDC is I can go ahead and do the belts and get everything precise the way I like it and for now I thought we'd just go ahead and open this up and see what we got This is a custom clutch that was ordered. I don't want to touch it with my hands. I'm going to try and just wrap it here and I'll show you guys. Ah, this is very nice. Let's see if I'm bringing it closer and let you guys see it and see there that there's no spacers on this. They've actually pushed the metal outwards. So anyway, this was cheaper than the one on Summit that only had four springs. And one of the reasons I liked it was that it had a lot of springs, which should make driving in the city a little bit easier. So, oh, I can't wait to get that on. So all right, while I was waiting for the clutch disc to come in, I went ahead and replaced the rear main seal and pilot bearing. Also replaced the guide tube and the clutch fork bearings. So you can see the new ones here. And I had the flywheel resurfaced. You can also see my OT mark now. I had to take a steel brush and clean this off. It's so shallow that you just couldn't see it through the hole. And I always kind of had to guess, as I mentioned. And I also put a red mark down here to line up with the notch and the bell housing like the later cars do. So I should never have any issue trying to find top dead center on this flywheel ever again. So I'm going to start putting everything back together now. All right, I got the flywheel torqued down now, and I sprayed it off with Bright Clean to remove any residue. And here is the new clutch disc. See, it spins perfect, clearing the bolts. This is a really nice disc. And uh, I'm wearing gloves, so that way I don't get any fingerprints on the flywheel or this disc. And I'm also going to spray the pressure plate off with some Bright Clean and wipe it off and install it. So I now have the pressure plate put back on and all nine bolts torqued down. And at this point what you want to do is take your clutch alignment tool and make sure that the pressure plate has plenty of clamping force on the clutch. You do not want to be able to spin it. You would hate to find out that something has gone wrong after you've got the bell housing back on. And as you remember, the old worn out clutch disc I could turn very easily and this new clutch disc I cannot. And that's the way it should be, so we're good to go here. I'm going to go ahead and get the bell housing put back on. So, Alright, we're getting ready to put the transmission in now. And you can see I can no longer turn the shaft. And one thing you want to do before you put the transmission back in is have someone push the clutch in. Go ahead and push the clutch in. And spin the tube to make sure that it is not binding. You can see how freely that spins. Go ahead and release it and just want to make sure that everything is working properly. Back here I've already replaced the fuel filter and all the fuel lines. I also replaced the fuel pump and the fuel pump mounts. So we're good to go back here and we're going to get this transmission put in. All right, we now have the transmission and the exhaust back in. All right, one of the power steering hose is leaking, so I went ahead and ordered a new one, and we're getting ready to put that on. So, all right, I got the reference sensors out the other day, and I noticed that these are the original reference sensors that came on the car when new, and the rubber boots just completely disintegrated on them. Also, this plastic up here, started crumbling out and rather than end up with a no start issue down the road I'm just going to go ahead and replace these so I've got a box of them here I'm going to go ahead and open it up so here we 
here are the new reference sensors. All right, here are the two new reference sensors. And I'm just gonna take the old ones and set them aside because you can always use them to make a tool that you can gap your speed and reference sensors with, like this one here. If you haven't seen my video on gapping the speed and reference sensors yet, I'll put a link to it up here on the screen. And here's the tool that I made in that video. And you can see my washer glued on there. And this is what I'm gonna be using to gap this today. I'm going to be inserting it like that. And that's going to set our gap. Then I will remove this once I have it locked down and install these sensors. So I have the bracket on now and as you can see it's easier to get in here with the intake off and uh, another thing to note is this is an early car so I was able to put the bell housing on and then install the bracket but if you have a later car that has a reference sensor shielding then you're going to need to put the bracket on at the same time that you're installing the bell housing over here I have my gap tool so what I'm going to be doing is taking this and putting it down in that second hole there and then tightening it down and once I have this tightened down here then it's going to give me the exact gap that I need for my sensors and then I can lock the two bolts down on the bracket then I can remove this and then I can install my sensors. All right, I have my gap tool in now and it's completely locked down. Next, I just need to push down on the bracket to make sure that the tool is resting on the starter ring teeth. And then I'll lock down these two bolts there on the bracket. And that's how you gap your speed and reference. So I now have the bracket locked down and the tool removed. I have my new sensors here that I'm getting ready to install. And you can see that I put a little bit of anti-seize on them. So Hopefully next time anybody has to remove these, they won't be stuck in there like they were. Out with the old and in with the new. Now I'm ready to get the intake put on. All right, I'm putting the intake on now. And the first thing you want to do is make sure you pull these hoses through here. So that way they don't end up clamped underneath your intake there. And before I put any bolts in it whatsoever, I like to lift the intake up and make sure that I get the hose that's underneath there. It gives me a little bit better access. Then I put the Venturi on here. You can see that I just need to clamp it down there. And here are our two ports up here on the front. This one comes from the thermostat valve. And this one here comes from the control valve and also goes to the fuel pressure regulator and damper. So all right, I'm slowly getting this engine back together after changing the clutch. I went ahead and removed all the belts so that way I could get everything timed up perfectly because I couldn't see the flywheel marks before and I prefer to go through and time the car that way. But I now have the intake on. I took the intake off because it was just too hard to get back there to the speed and reference sensors and I went ahead and replaced those anyway. But anyway, I got the intake on now and I've got all the vacuum lines hooked up, the wiring harness is connected. The only thing that I really need to do is get the belt cover on here and hook up the accessories, then put the new oxygen sensor on, and this thing should be good to go. A few years ago, I replaced the clutch master cylinder, the line going to the slave, and the slave cylinder, so this car is ready to go. So I mostly have this engine back together now, and I should be firing it up this evening, and I can't wait to test out the new wiring harness that I built for the headlights and see how much brighter they are. You can see I've got the belt cover and distributor back on now. I've also refilled the power steering because I changed the power steering hoses down here. And next I'm gonna be installing this O2 sensor. You can see I have it here. And you wanna use these type of connectors for it. You can see this is the original wire here that came on the car and then I just clipped it and connected them together. You don't want to solder this wire or use any heat shrink. You want to do it just like that. So once I get that in, there won't be very much left to do. So, Alright, I have the headlight harness in now and you can see how it's hooked up to the back of the alternator there. And now I can put the air box in and we'll be ready to start this thing up. 
So all right, I now have the headlight harness that I built hooked up. I'm gonna be firing up the engine and doing a comparison between the stock harness and my harness. Now keep in mind the stock harness is only gonna be running one bulb, so the voltage will be a little bit higher than it was when I tested it before, but you'll get the idea. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the car here. Turn headlights on, you can see I got the high beams on. Then we'll come around here. And uh, you see that I have the light on. Next we're going to test my new harness. Say I'm getting 13.5 volts. Much higher than the 11.8. Sorry guys, I don't know if you can see the difference at home, but there is a rather big difference here. And uh, I'm going to be plugging in my harness into this light. Oh, that's much better. All right, I got this white poster board here and I'm gonna stick it under the car like that. So far, it's been sitting here for a couple of hours and you can see there's absolutely no drips. What I'm gonna do is go around and start the engine. And I want you guys to see just how great this thing starts up. This car loves running now. I figured we could just sit here and look for drift. Everything looks good. Sorry to let the car idle until the fans came on, which took about 10 to 15 minutes, as you can see. Absolutely no drips or leaks at all. I'm gonna go ahead and leave it here overnight, just to see, although I'm not expecting it to leak. My 88 doesn't leak either. And for the occasion, I went ahead and cleaned up the belly pan here. You see it looks really nice and shiny. The other side is painted, so it doesn't look quite as nice, but I'll come out here tomorrow and check again, and We'll go ahead and put the belly pan on and this thing will be almost ready to go home. All right, there's not very much left to do to this car. One of the things not working is the clock. So I went over to a parts car and pulled one out and it doesn't work either. So rather than try and buy one on eBay for 50 bucks that'll work maybe a year or so, I'm gonna try my hand at rebuilding these. So stay tuned for a video on that. And the next thing I needed to fix was the AC here. You can see when I turned this knob, absolutely nothing happened. So I went over and checked the fuse in the fuse box. Everything looked good. I even swapped out the relay and it was fine. I checked the voltage here with my multimeter and I was getting 12 volts and I even tried a spare switch just to make sure. And I followed the wires over here once I removed this panel and ended up finding these two relays up here. You can see this one on the right side there in black. This is the one that I pulled out. And whenever I would push it together and make it contact, it would work and make the fans under the hood turn on and the blower would come on as well. But it wouldn't stay on. So I got a relay here out of a parts car that I'm going to put in and I'm not sure if it's going to stay on either, but we'll try it out. So let me go ahead and push it all the way in there. Oh, there you go guys. We've even got the fans on under the hood now. So 
It was a very simple fix. The only thing that I need to do was change that relay there. Sorry guys, I've got two analog clocks from an early 944 here. And I've got one taken apart already. And uh, from what I understand, when they stop running, usually the issue is related to these two capacitors here. And as you can see, I've got a few capacitors, so I'm going to try my hand at fixing both of these. As mentioned, you can already see that I have this one apart. And this is the tool that I used. This is a tool that I had laying around. I got it at Walmart. And it just so happens it had a few things on it that worked perfectly for removing the bezel here. So, you can see this one here. It just was able to pry it in there underneath and then I was able to walk it around and once I got it all the way around lifted up then this just came off and this knob comes with it so don't have to worry about it all it does is press in and turn against this here so I've got my soldering iron all heated up here I want to go ahead and try and get these off and just see what happens. Sorry, and I have the two capacitors removed and I have two new ones ready to go in. But before I get to that, what I want to do is go ahead and start taking the other clock apart and see. First, you need to remove this bezel. It goes around the outside and you're going to take a tool similar to this here. And you're just going to sort of pry it in between here and then just work it all the way around sort of like that right there and be careful that you don't get injured because it does like to fold up just pop free and stab things so just make sure it isn't you all right once you have it lifted up all the way around then your bezel should just pop right off Just like that, and again, this little knob comes off with the face. See it here without the bezel. Now all I need to do is remove these two screws on each side. It's all right, once you have the screws removed, what you wanna do is stick a soldering iron right here, and just let that pin come out with the clock itself. So once you heat the solder up here on this, then the clock will slide out of the case. This is what grounds it to the chassis and allows the clock to operate. So you want to make sure that you leave that sticking out like that so you can put it back. And now I'm going to start putting the capacitors in. So all right, now that I have the other clock apart, I'm going to go ahead and put capacitors in the other clock. And you want to make sure that you have it oriented correctly. See here I have a negative here for this one and a negative here for this one. And on this one, we have the opposite. This one, we have a positive symbol and a positive symbol, but no negative, but obviously. The one unmarked would be your negative. So just make sure that you put them in correctly. Of course, the side of the capacitor with the black stripe is going to be your negative. And that's how I'm going to assemble this. And you can see my negative here. All right, I now have the capacitors in and they're trimmed up nice and tidy. And I'm gonna go ahead and test this. I'm gonna put the positive here and I'm going to put the ground on that post there. So all right, this is the clock that came out of the car. And you can see I have my positive connected up here, and then I just have the ground sitting right there on that post. You can see my brand new capacitors down in there, and the clock is now running. Before it did nothing at all, and now we have a running clock, so that is awesome. I'm going to get this back together and put the clock back in. Alright, I got the capacitors out of this one, and I'm going to go ahead and fix this one as well.
All right, once you get your screws put back in your case and you've got your pin lined up, you're gonna to wanna to add some solder here. That way it'll be grounded. And your clock will run. So before I bother to put the bezel back on, I'm gonna go ahead and test it one more time just to make sure that it's still running. So all right, guys, as I had said before, what you do is you put the screws back in the housing and then you solder the housing to the stud there. And I was actually getting a good connection between this terminal here and the stud. It was perfect. However, the clock would no longer work when I'd pull it out and I'd connect the ground to the stud, it would work again. But no matter what I did, I couldn't get this to work the way it was. So I'm not entirely certain that the ground wasn't the issue with this thing the entire time. So what I did was, I ran a wire down in there to where the stud was, ran the wire out, and I was just gonna put a spade terminal on like this and then connect the ground. However, the bulb for the light actually needs this whole entire housing to be grounded so that way it can work. So what I did was I ran the wire out and then I ran it to this here and then a wire just comes straight off. So that way the light can get power and the clock can get power. It's not as clean as I had hoped, but again, I'm not entirely certain the ground wasn't the issue to begin with and it's very difficult to solder to this galvanized steel and I didn't want to try and put a screw in here and risk tearing the clock up. All right, I got the light working and I got the clock working. So overall, this was a success and uh, I'm gonna try and get this back together so I can install it now. So, all right, I've got the clock in now and everything, as far as I know, is working as it should on this car. The only thing left to do is wash it and turn the keys back over to the owner. All right guys, I got the clock fixed last night and it's still keeping perfect time. So I'm out on its first test drive since changing the clutch and this thing is driving great. And I can let the gas off and I'm not being jerked back in my seat. You can see I floor it and let it go and it's very smooth now. I'm very happy with the performance of this car. And so far I've got no leaks. Everything is looking excellent. And uh, I'm going to take it out this evening and we're going to see what the headlights are like. Alright, I just got back from driving it around the block. I want to put some miles on it, make sure nothing's leaking and everything's working as it should. And uh, she's running great so far. Thought I'd pop the hood here and let you guys see. It's nice to see this thing out of the shop finally. Just look how clean everything is. No drips of any kind so far. Everything's sealed up tight. Everything's running smoothly. And uh, like I said, I'll take her out tonight. And we'll see what these headlights can do now. Sorry guys, it's now dark. So I thought I would take the car out again and check the headlights. Here are the low beams here and you can see that it looks fantastic. So I'm gonna try the high beams. All right, yeah, it's kind of hard to see, but they are very bright. And uh, that's gonna do it guys. This car is ready to go home. All right guys, this car is going home tomorrow. So I thought I'd take it around the block just one last time and look for anything that I could probably fix. Uh, one last thing that I did see was that the passenger side headlight would bounce whenever you're sitting at a red light. So I went ahead and tightened that up. And uh, it's just little things that are annoying like that that I want to try and find and get those fixed before this car goes back. So anyway, we started off by removing the head because the coolant was leaking from the head gasket. And then we replaced all the gaskets and seals. Then we did a front of engine service that required doing the front main seal. Then we did the belts and rollers, put a new water pump in, and We've done the oil cooler seals and we replaced the oil cooler housing. Then I adjusted the passenger side door handle, put new tie rods on, and took it in for an alignment. Had the oil changed. I went through and we rebuilt all four calipers. And then I inspected the clutch and discovered that the rubber center clutch was blown. I then changed the clutch 
I'm gonna put a brand new disc in. Had the flywheel resurfaced, clutch fork bearings replaced, new rear main seal and pilot bearing. Put in new speed and reference sensors, inspected the rear fuel lines, new rear speakers and all new wiring, cleaned up the radio wiring harness, and replaced the horn pad clip. Then I built a headlight harness, and that was to add a little bit more power to the headlights or a little bit more brightness to them. And then I troubleshooted the AC system because whenever I turned the switch, absolutely nothing happened. It ended up being a faulty relay. And then I repaired the clock. So, beyond that, ended up getting a new power steering hose as well. And then I flushed the power steering system. The brake system was flushed when I rebuilt the calipers. And we got brand new oil put in it when we took it in for the oil change so this thing is ready to go for many many more miles so the day is finally here i'm finally taking the silver 944 back to its owner and i think he's going to be very happy with it we fixed the steering we went through the engine i mean we replaced every seal except the oil pan seal because we didn't have to drop the oil pan but every other seal was replaced and verified not to leak and then we did a clutch job on it. This clutch feels great. It's going to be even better when it breaks in a little bit. Right now it likes to grab, but I'd rather have a grabbing clutch than a slipping clutch. So anyway, guys, I think he's going to love it. And uh, I just tried to go through and find anything else that could be wrong. We fixed this clock and I cleaned up the interior just a little bit. And uh, we put some new rear speakers in. The radio is now loud. So yeah, I think he's going to be happy with it. Um, just a few minutes away from his house. Sorry guys, we got that silver 944 taken home this morning. And uh, my next series of videos is actually going to be on this 83 Porsche 928. It currently is not running, so... I'm going to be going through it and trying to get it running and it needs a lot of work after that and we'll just see where it goes but I hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll see you next time.